Hey guys, what's going on? Andy Baker, andybaker.com, an owner of Kingwood Strength and Conditioning. And uh, today what we're going to do is a whiteboard lesson on the mystery of deloads and deloading. Um, what it's for, how to do it, that sort of thing. Um, I'm of the opinion that the, the, the conversation about deloading is way too complicated. It's really not that complicated of a concept and it's not that complicated of a strategy to implement. Um, the details of how you do it um, certainly if you're peaking for a meet, that sort of thing, if you're an advanced athlete and you're trying to taper and peak down for a meet, then yes, the details matter a little bit more. But for most of us that are just trying to back off the training a little bit in order to get recovered and dissipate some fatigue, it's not absolutely 100% critical that you be absolutely precise with your numbers in terms of how many sets and reps do you do, what percentage of your 1RM do you operate at. Now you can certainly mess this up and there's good ways and bad ways to go about it but there's a pretty broad range where you can get in of different strategies you can use that will work to deload so the main thing is is just use a little bit of common sense the purpose of the deload is to let some of the accumulated fatigue that we have generated from our training program so it's the it's the 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 stress that we apply to ourselves in order to force a positive adaptation that has obviously the good the good qualities of helping us build muscle mass, get stronger, that sort of thing. But also the downside is that as we're applying that stress to us that we recover from and adapt to and get stronger, at the same time, we have this kind of backdrop of growing fatigue. And every now and again, we just have to stop, kind of pump the brakes a little bit and let some of that fatigue dissipate so that we can continue to grow and get stronger. Okay, and that's really all that we're trying to do when we're deloading is just rest a little bit let some of that accumulated fatigue drop off a little bit and then resume our normal training program again. So the big thing with, de with deloading is don't do anything that is going to apply new stress to you, okay? Um, if what you're doing during the deload is kind of perceived as really hard or really difficult, um, you're probably overdoing it during the deload. Deload training should be fairly easy. Now, if you're coming into the deload really, really fatigued and maybe even a little bit overtrained, sometimes that first week of the deload doesn't really feel as easy as you think it should. And that's actually a really, really good sign that you timed your deload correctly. Okay. So I've got some clients that I work with and we deload, maybe we train three to six weeks and then we take a week off and they will routinely tell me, man, that deload didn't feel as light as it should. And I'll, I'll tell them back that's a good sign that we're timing the deload right because if you drop the intensity down, the volume down, that sort of thing, and it still feels kind of hard, that means you're due for a deload, okay? So what I tell them is just think about if we had left things where they were, we had kept the volume up, kept the intensity up, and then you tried to train this week. If, you know, sets of three at 70% were perceived as hard, how hard would sets of three at 85% have felt? So uh, sometimes that week doesn't feel as easy as you think it should, but on paper, when you look at it, you really shouldn't be adding anything uh, to your program. You're always going to be dialing things back a little bit. So, and there's lots and lots and lots of ways to do that. So, um, one of the things I want to go over is people will ask, they'll say, well, when I deload, what do I back off of? Do I reduce the volume way down? Do I reduce the intensity way down? Do I shave off the number of exercises? Do I take more days off? How do I, how do, I do that? Like, what factors do I look at to deload? Um, the answer to that can be any and all of them, okay? So what I always tell people is the main thing is that you deload the primary source of stress in your training program. So if you look at all these different training programs that we have, whether it's my programs, other people's programs, there's lots and lots of different ways to generate stress, okay? Stress being the thing that drives, the, it's the stimulus that causes the adaptation, okay? You can get that a multitude of ways, and there's di different programs go about doing that differently. So with some programs, you're gonna generate that stress with higher volumes, more frequency, more sets and reps, that sort of thing. Other programs are more intensity driven, okay? The frequency may be a little bit lower, the overall set volume may be a little bit lower, but you've got more really, really hard sets in there, okay? Uh, more sets closer to failure, maybe more sets at a higher 1RM, depending on what type of program you're doing. But stress can be driven by volume or intensity. It doesn't, it's not always one or the other. So in different people will respond better to different types of programming. So that's, that's not the discussion right now though. Right now is the discussion is 
whatever type of program you're using, look at the primary driver of stress in that program, and that's the main thing that you want to deload. Okay, so if you're on a really high volume program, you're doing lots of sets and reps every day, you're training the lifts with a, a pretty high frequency, you're definitely gonna to wanna to back off of the volume and potentially the frequency as well. Definitely gonna to wanna to cut back on the sets and reps that you're doing during that, during the week. However, you, you may want to keep, you may consider keeping the intensity somewhat elevated or only a small drop. Okay, so I'll often tell people, a volume drop could really be, depending on how high your volume is, a volume drop could be anywhere from 25% to 75%. I think in general, about a 50% drop is probably a good middle ground. A 25% drop may not be enough of a reduction to really make any significant improvements. 75% drop may be a little bit too much. 50% is a good middle ground. So let's say if you were doing uh, five sets of five was one of your workouts, maybe you reduce that down to like, four sets of three or six sets of two. So 12 reps would be approximately 50%. So that's one way of doing it is just arbitrarily kind of cut volume by about 50%. But in doing so, you may not want to, you may not want to back off your intensity that much. The intensity will preserve your strength where the volume, the volume will allow you to recover. So if you back off of both too much, you might run the risk of detraining a little bit. So now that being said, I, I might back off the intensity a little bit, maybe a 5% drop, 5 to 10% drop. So if you back off the volume 50% and you back off the intensity about 5 or 10%, that's going to be pretty good uh, in terms of letting you maintain your strength, but allowing plenty of recovery for you to get recovered within a week or two of that lower volume training. So, um, so that's, kind of, that's kind of number one there is if, you're, if your training is more volume based, Back off the volume, but keep the intensity up a little bit, okay? So not quite as severe of a drop. Now, if you're doing the inverse, where you've got a program that's more intensity-driven, intensity-based programming, but lower volume, you don't really want to cut volume that much lower, okay? Because then, again, if, you get, if you're already low frequency, low volume, and you cut that back even more, again, you get to a point where it's so low that you're going to maybe allow some detraining to creep in. If you're prone to that so what I would have guys do is actually occasionally I would cut the intensity way back and I might actually even dial up the volume just a little bit okay to kind of make up for that but it would be a big big drop in intensity so if if a guy is following a program that's that's kind of that's re, that's really high intensity but really low volume so let's say he's got a program that maybe there's some assistant stuff thrown in but it's kind of the old school powerlifting type routines where we had just that one big main set that we work up to maybe once a week. So his squat, his squat training is really based on that one big set, like once per week. That's already extremely low volume and frequency. So if we dial that back, what I might have him do is I might have him cut the intensity way back, like maybe just 60% of his one rep max. So it cuts way back, but I might increase the volume a little bit to like, three sets of five or three sets of three or something like that. So it might actually wind up being a little bit more work than he's used to be doing on the, instead of the one main set, he might do three lighter sets. So technically that that's an increase in volume, but if the intensity is low enough, it's not really a source of stress. Okay. So remember what I was saying is don't add new stress. You can, you could raise or, or you, you could raise volume a little bit but not necessarily increase the stress if the intensity is kept low enough. It's just a means to kind of preserve uh, the work capacity there and not let the volume drop too, too low. So, so that's, kind of the, that's kind of point one here is deload the source of the stress. So if it's intensity-based training, drop the intensity way down, possibly increase the volume just a little bit in order to not let the work capacity drop too far. Um, and then if your programming is volume based, you're going to drop, drop the volume way, way down, but preserve the intensity a little bit. So, uh, okay. So we talked about, uh, programs that are intensity based and programs that are volume based. Well, what do you do if you're doing something where the programming is both? So it's like my conjugate program has both an intensity element to it with the max effort day, um, obviously. And then there's a, uh, a volume component to it as well with a very high volume of assistance work plus the dynamic effort work, which is lighter, but also fairly high volume. So what do we do if it's both? Well, it's the same concepts apply exactly. You're gonna reduce the source of the stress on that day. So on your volume work, so whether it's your dynamic effort work um, or whether it's your assistance work, 
cut the volume down by roughly 50% and keep the weights basically where they're at. So if you're used to doing 10 sets of three at 60 to 80% of one RM, do five sets of three, something like that. But just so cut the sets down, but keep the intensity up. The same thing on the assistance exercises. If you're used to doing, you know, let's say three to five sets of a movement, just do one or two sets of the assistance work and that will preserve the adaptation pretty well. Uh, you can keep the weights up, but just do less sets. So on the volume based stuff, same thing, keep the weights up, but drop the intensity way, way down, or keep the, keep the intensity up, but drop the volume way, way down. Okay, and then on the max effort movements or the movements that are more intensity driven, some maybe even some of the heavier supplemental work that you might be doing, the same concept. You could actually even cut that out if you've got enough volume work still left in your program. You could just say, okay, this week I'm not gonna do a max effort exercise. I'm just gonna give myself a break. Otherwise, I would keep, I would just, because you've still got the volume in your program, there's no reason to raise the volume of that max effort work. I would just cut the intensity down and keep the volume low. So maybe instead of doing you know, a one rep max on a movement, just work up to a single at like 80 to 85%. Typically, I wouldn't even get into the 90% range. On a deload week, I really don't see a read. So we talk about preserving intensity, but that's you have to put that in context a little bit and it's a, it's a bit relative. I would not do anything on a deload week that has weights at or above 90%. So on that max effort day, if you still wanna work up to kind of a top single that day just to kind of preserve the, uh, the nature of the, of the program, I would just limit that single to like 80, 85%. And then that's that's good for that. Again, you get up into singles, even at like 90%, um, that's gonna be a little bit too much intensity to really qualify as a deload. So just take whichever day that you're doing and modify the source of the stress on that day kind of according to these principles. Okay, so we talked about deloading intensity, um, deloading volume, deloading frequency. That's kind of a way to reduce the systemic stress um, of your training program, but there's another element of a deload that I don't think people talk about as, as much and, th and this varies quite a bit from individual to individual and that is deloading acute stress to certain areas of the body that tend to get overtrained. So let's say, um, let's talk about like a real common one for most people um, would be uh, the lower back. Okay, so if you're doing a program, you've got a lot of squats, a lot of low bar squats, a lot of deadlifting, stiff leg deadlifts, good mornings, that sort of thing. It's very, very easy when you're doing a lot of that stuff with higher intensities, higher volumes, the lower back becomes very, very acutely fatigued. Okay, so in, during a deload, one of the things that I like to look at, and again, it varies lifter to lifter, is do we have an area of the body that is really, that is really struggling to recover? And if so, let's eliminate all the exercises that stress that portion of the body, or at least most of the exercises or or eliminate um, you know, certain movements, maybe keep some, but eliminate others. So like a guy that's really struggling with a lot of lower back fatigue, on his deload week, I'm probably not gonna have him do like bent over barbell rows. I might have him switch to a chest supported row. I'd probably really back off of deadlifting. I would probably cut out things like stiff leg deadlifts, certainly like rack pulls. So anything that contributes significantly to that portion of the body that tends to get very acutely fatigued, you really, really want to dial back or completely eliminate those exercises altogether and replace with something different, okay? Um, it could be elbows. So a lot of guys, they tend to have either one or both elbows that tends to get, you know, really, really fatigued and they're always dealing with kind of that creeping little bit of, uh, you know, golfer's elbow or tennis elbow that's always creeping up. During a deload week, I would probably cut out any kind of tricep-based extension work. No lying tricep extensions. Um, if it's dips or close grip benches, whatever it is, whatever that source of stress is, it tends to aggravate that part of the body. Cut that movement out completely and let those little nagging injuries heal up, okay? We don't, we don't need to do any of that kind of stuff. It, maybe it's uh, a shoulder, you know, maybe flat bench presses aggravate your shoulder quite a bit. You know, switch that movement out. Use a pair of dumbbells or narrow the grip a little bit. Make some adjustment, but you can, you can definitely modify exercises or completely eliminate exercises in order to allow those little things to creep up. So that's, that's another area that you wanna look at besides just the systemic stress is that localized stress to certain areas of the body that tend to get overtrained more than others. Um, so that's kind of point number one there. Um, point number two, uh, and this is, uh, this is typically how I really, really like to treat deloads. Um, is with a frequency deload, okay? So what does that mean? A frequency deload 
basically means you don't change any of the factors within the training sessions themselves, okay? Okay, so in this first point up here, um, what we're really talking about is keeping the same schedule uh, that we normally train on. So if we train three, four, or five days a week, we're basically keeping that schedule, but we're reducing the stress of each uh, individual workout. So we're reducing the volume and or intensity, making lots of changes, maybe cutting out assistance exercises, that sort of thing. But we're making changes to the workouts themselves, but basically keeping the same schedule. A frequency deload is a good option for a lot of people to try if they don't want to tinker with the individual workouts themselves. So on a frequency deload, now you can do these in combination. You can deload the workouts themselves and reduce the frequency. And that might just be a means of cutting down volume. So you may cut your training from four or five days a week to three days a week, just as a kind of a means to cutting volume. But what I'm really talking about here with the frequency deloads is not adjusting the workouts at all. You're gonna keep the workouts themselves stressful. You're gonna keep volume up. You're gonna keep intensity up. You're gonna keep your assistance exercises in there. You're gonna do everything that you normally would do. We're just gonna adjust the frequency. I use this a lot with people. And to me, this is a much simpler way to do it. Um, it definitely prevents detraining and it does a really, really good job of dissipating fatigue. So to me, the easiest way to dissipate fatigue is more days off, just more rest. Rather than trying to come in and, and, and get really precise with, okay, well, I'm still gonna train today, but how much volume do I drop? How much intensity do I drop? There's definitely more room for error in there of kind of accidentally overdoing it a little bit. And there are guys out there that never really make their deloads light enough or easy enough. And so they wind up not really deloading properly because they're still in the gym kind of pushing that stress up a little bit and not allowing enough fatigue to dissipate. But if you just take more days off during the week, you can't really mess that up. So you will get recovered with more days off and still allow you to train at normal workloads without having to really make too many adjustments. Okay, so a frequency deload basically just means taking your normal schedule and spreading it out over a longer time period. That's almost always what it winds up looking like. So you have more days off within your training cycle. Most of us are designing training programs that fit the confines of a week. So a, you know, a Sunday to Saturday is a week, Monday to Saturday, that's, that's kind of our, our week. Um, and that's really just a social construct. There's, there's nothing, our, our body doesn't know whether it's Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or, or whether our week is seven days. So there's no reason that your week can't be spread out over say a nine or 10 day period in order to give you a little bit longer to string that training cycle out. There's lots of different ways to do that. So I just wrote up a few examples up here. So um, for those of you that train like on a typical Monday, Wednesday, Friday, full body type of split. So you're working your whole body hard and heavy three days a week on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you can simply cut that down to two days a week. Um, so if you've got, let's say you're doing a, um, a stressful heavy, light, medium type program that's done Monday, Wednesday, Friday, now you could do heavy, light, medium done Monday, Thursday, Monday, and that becomes your week, heavy, light, medium, Monday, Thursday, Monday, and then you would start the training cycle over again. So you could take that three-day program and put it on a twice a week schedule, or if you want, that's, that would put you in the gym twice a week. Um, if you wanted to bump up the frequency just a little bit and you'd still be in the gym two to three days a week, um, you could train on a one-on, two-off type schedule, okay? And so that creates an irregular pattern. So depending on kind of your lifestyle and schedule, it may or may not work for a lot of people. A lot of people are gonna do better on a fixed two-day-a-week schedule. So Monday, Thursday, Tuesday, Friday, Wednesday, Saturday, that sort of thing. If you've got the freedom, you might be able to just do a one-on, two-off. So that would mean train a day, take two days off. Train a day, take two days off. So it would be like Monday, Thursday, Sunday, Wednesday, Saturday, that sort of thing. So you could see how that, that's actually gonna increase your frequency just a little bit, but you'll still have two full days off after every training session, and you should be plenty recovered doing that. So um, that's one way to do it. The other way to do it is if you're normally training Monday, Wednesday, Friday, full body, is to do keep the Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule, but change things over to an upper lower split and roll that across a three day week, okay? So if we're Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we might do lower body Monday, Wednesday upper, Friday lower again, and then Monday upper again. So you would take four workouts and roll them across that three day week, which would make your week then becomes Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Monday, okay? And you could do that anywhere from like two to six weeks or even longer, maybe even like two to 12 weeks. 
or just until you kind of auto-regulate the thing until you start feeling pretty good again and start feeling pretty fresh. And then you could go back to the Monday, Wednesday, Friday type deal. And that might become a very regular pattern for you. That might become something where you say, all right, I'm going to train six to 12 weeks, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, full body. And then I'm just going to have a cutoff point where every six or 12 weeks I switch and do Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but alternating upper body and lower body workouts. It's just kind of a preemptive way to keep yourself from getting overtrained. Is just kind of figure out those kind of arbitrary stop and, st stop and start points and change your programming up between periods of higher volume and higher frequency between, and then between lower volume and lower frequency, but possibly higher intensity. So you could, if you figure out your body's own pattern, you can very easily come up with routines like that that make sense for you. So, um, so that's one way to uh, manipulate, or that's two ways to manipulate kind of the Monday, Wednesday, Friday full body routine. Um, and then we can do the same thing with a four day split. Okay, so if you're training a four day split, whether that's like a four day Texas method or like my four day, um, you know, conjugate uh, type plan or any kind of four day, typically it's gonna be upper body, lower body, or that sort of thing. But any kind of four day program, let's say, say you're typically training Monday and Tuesday and then Thursday and Friday, you can do the same thing we did up here is take that four day split and just roll it across a three day week. Okay, so instead of training four days, you would train Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then Monday. And then that becomes your week. So instead of taking those four workouts and cramming them in to like that five day period, you're opening it up and cramming it into like a seven or eight day period. So you get a little bit more time off there. The workouts themselves don't change. This would be like upper, lower, upper, lower. So your week just gets a little bit longer. Okay, so that's one way to do the four day split. The other way to do the four day split and this is, I've got some guys in my coaching group that are doing this with my, with my four day conjugate routine. And it seems to be working really, really well for them is that if you're say, especially if your split is broken up between volume days and intensity days, like the conjugate program is week one is basically a volume week. So Tuesday, you would do like your volume, volume, upper body workout Thursday, your volume, lower body workout. And then in week two is basically your intensity week. You would do an, uh, higher intensity upper body session here and then the higher intensity lower body session here. So in this way, you're really cutting down the frequency. You're taking the whole, the whole thing and dividing it up. You're taking a one week program and spreading it out over two full weeks. Okay. And so that really, really works. And I had some guys do that as a, a temporary deload and they liked it so much and made so much progress and felt so good doing that where that has just become their staple and they just stay with that. So now, on both of these days, so I have volume and intensity. On both of these days, though, there's a lot of assistance work. Okay, so, and that's one of the good things about uh, training just twice a week is you really can't, it's very difficult to overtrain with added assistance work. Okay, if you're training, all you got all four days it's crammed into mon uh, Monday to Friday, you really have to kind of watch how much assistance work you add, how many sets and reps you do on that assistance work, um, you know, how many exercises, how close to failure you push all of those things because you've, you've got to kind of balance out the stress in there and not, uh, not, over, not overdo it because you have more workouts coming up in like 48 to 72 hours. But with this, you've got so much time off between workouts. I mean, you can go nuts here um, and you can definitely overdo it, but it's really not that consequential because you're gonna have a whole another week until you do the similar movements again. So um, both of these days allow for a lot of assistance work. And so they have two really, really hard sessions per week, but they've got so many days off that they recover really, really well from it. So this will work for some people. I mean, some people do really well on low frequency and some people don't. So this would be one of those things where you would just have to trial and error it. I, I know for a fact that it works in the short term, whether it would be a long-term solution for you or not, you just have to try it and see, but it works really, really well in the short term. It's just don't make any modifications. Just take your four day program and spread it out over a two week period, train it twice a week. Um, and then we can do the same thing that we've done on these other ones. We can do it. So I'm just using my five day power building program, uh, which typically starts on Sunday and goes through Friday. And you would take two days off per week. Usually, usually the way I have it designed is Tuesday and Saturday are off, but however you lay it out, you're training five days per week within the week. So again, that, that can get pretty stressful over time. If you're pushing everything, you're pushing volume, you're pushing intensity, you're pushing assistance, you do all that stuff, five days of training. Can get pretty tough so what i'll have guys do is say all right don't you don't have to alter the workouts at first if you don't want to just scale back on the frequency and we'll take that five day program and open it up and roll it across a three-day week okay so now we have 
day one is Monday, day two Wednesday, day three Friday, day four the following Monday, and day five is the following Wednesday. So now your week goes Monday to the following Wednesday. So I, it becomes like a 10 day week or something like that that you fit the five workouts across. And you could follow that anywhere from, usually I'd say two to four weeks of that lower, uh, lower frequency training, or maybe you just say until I get through each workout two or three times, and then I'll go back to a more condensed and compressed schedule for, to train each movement a little bit more frequently. So, but, but that can be a really good way to get recovered. Um, I have another guy that I work with, and this is, again, this is one of those things. He's kind of totally auto-regulated this um, based on how he feels. Um, but it seems to work really, really well for him. And it's kind of the same concept. He runs my five-day power building split. And so basically, he'll, he'll run this thing for anywhere from 8 to 12 weeks until he starts feeling like he's getting beat up and fatigued, starts to lose motivation for training, um, is staying sore longer, lightweights are starting to feel maybe heavier than they should, can't get a pump that sort of thing. All of those things are all indicators that you're uh, potentially pushing to the brink of overreaching or worse, overtraining. So um, what he does when he starts to feel that way, and again, his is totally auto-regulated, you could set kind of arbitrary cutoff points of anywhere from you know six to 12 weeks or something like that where you do something like this. But what he does is he just changes the routine. So instead of staying with, with the typical layout that I use on my power building split, he switches to a, a like a legs push pull split. Okay, so he does all his lower body stuff on Monday, and then he does like a chest shoulder tricep workout Tuesday, and then like a back and bicep workout Wednesday. So he trains his whole body in a legs push pull format, month, three days in a row: Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, using fairly light weights, and then Thursday through Sunday he just takes completely off. Okay, so he has a four day rest period in there and every time he comes back from that, he feels like a million bucks. So that's the pattern that works for him. You could come up with something similar. Um, maybe that's just train Monday, Tuesday, upper, lower, and then you take Wednesday through Sunday off. A lot of people are scared to take that much time off of the gym. I honestly think that for most people, that's a little bit in your head. Um, I really don't think that three, four, five days even out of the gym, you're gonna completely regress. Certainly, you come back in, maybe you don't feel uh, quite in the groove or that sort of thing if you're used to training with more frequency. But I do think a little bit of that is, is in your head that somehow if I'm not in the gym for you know two or three days or four days even, um, that I'm gonna somehow lose all my gains or regress or forget how to squat or bench or something like that. And largely that's kind of self-imposed thinking. So don't be afraid to take longer periods of time off. Um, as far as, you know, should I just not train and take a full week off? I think a couple times a year, that's actually a good idea, even if you do detrain a little bit. Um, if you tend to be a guy that's plagued by nagging injuries here and there, you know, elbows, knees, low back, shoulder, things like that, they just kind of get not necessarily injured, but just kind of get inflamed and irritated. A week off every now and again is not necessarily a bad deal. Will you detrain and lose a little bit? Probably a little bit. Um, but not as much as you probably think. Once you get past that 10 day mark, 10 days out of the gym, two weeks out of the gym, I definitely see it with my clients. There's something about that 10 day mark that certainly caught, that's kind of a tipping point to where you go into, you go kind of past just getting rested and you start to really get into being detrained. So, um, you know, prolonged periods of two or three weeks off, you know, that's just, that's a harder hill to climb back. Um, so, but a week off here and there is not necessarily a bad deal. Certainly three or four days off from time to time um, is, is not gonna hurt you. If you make regular habit out of it, um, you know, deloads are there for reducing stress. Missing time in the gym just because you're not in control of your schedule or you don't feel like training is not necessarily a deload. Deloads are there because we have pushed hard enough that our body can't really push any further without kind of going into the negative. So we're forced to take uh, time off and deload a little bit. So um, that's um, that's kind of my talk on deloading. Again, don't overcomplicate it. Use a little bit of intuition and common sense. Um, reduce the stress. Don't add any new stress. If the workouts that you're doing are feeling really, really hard on a deload week, you're probably pushing a little bit too hard. So use it to rest and recover. Don't stress too much over the details um, and you'll be just fine. All right. Thanks for listening, guys.